Thanks, y'all. Um, yeah, so my name is Garen Means. I am here from Austin, Texas in the United States. And I'm a, a JavaScript developer. I'm currently unemployed. Um, but um, when I am employed, I am a JavaScript developer. I do front end. I used to do um, .NET and Java before that. Um, but now I'm exclusively client side for the most part, except for a little bit of node stuff. Um, and that's me. And today I'm going to talk to you about content editable, um, which hopefully will be fun for everybody. So the name of this talk is, is Content Editable Role for Sanity. And just to give you a little background on what that means, um, there's, there's this role playing game called Call of Cthulhu. And um, the, it's based on the writings of a guy named H.P. Lovecraft, who was a little bananas, um, not quite um, fully sane himself. And he, he wrote all these stories about these, these monsters and demons. And the, the more, um, in, the, in the role playing game, the more you learn about this sort of world of creepy things that exist um, just outside our, our normal um, range of vision or range of knowledge or whatever, um, the more you learn about them, the, you, you, you do so at the risk of your own sanity. And so in the game, if you, if you learn something about Cthulhu, you have to roll for sanity and see how, how crazy that's made you. And my thinking was that that was very similar to content editable. Because content editable, it starts out really great. You're like, oh, this is this is a really cool property. I can just I can just throw on something, and it helps me do stuff, and that's that's really cool. And um, when you know just a little bit about it, it's fun and it's nice and it's it's easy to work with. Um, the more you figure out about it, and the deeper you go, the more horrifying it gets. Um, so it's a, it has a, a lot in common with Cthulhu. So let's talk about where content editable comes from. Um, it showed up in IE 5.5, and it was sort of hazily implemented, like a lot of these sort of uh, interesting properties that we get from IE 5.5 um, and it's some of its contemporaries. Um, it, it seems in hindsight that perhaps they weren't completely sure what they were going to do with it, but it was there, and um, it, you were able to use it. Um, at that point, you had to use it with a, another attribute called design mode, which lived on the, the body of the document. Um, and yeah, but you could you could do the things that you can do now with content editable as early as IE 5.5. And so then uh, its contemporaries, um, IE 5.5s, um, began adopting this, and they provided their own APIs for, for using it. And we'll talk about the APIs in more detail in a second. Um, but just to kind of give you a little quick preview, let's switch out of this guy. Oh, no, I forgot. I should have preloaded my tabs. I apologize, y'all. Um, we're not going to look at that hilarious chart, but um, the 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 chart I was going to show you was from um, Quirks Mode, and basically um, it's 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 funny to to look through it and see what IE supports. Um, and the the Quirks Mode chart is is six and seven versus Firefox three versus Safari two, and it's just it's like a, a disco of of red and green, like for every single property. So like there is basically no consistency, and that was the point of that. And then we get HTML5. Yay, HTML5. Um, so now HTML5 has adopted content editable, which is cool. And you can apply it to any element. You don't have to use um, design mode. Um, design mode does still exist. And you can use it to throw your entire document into a, a content editable kind of state. But um, it, it's no longer tied to um, content editable and using that. So now it's, it's becoming somewhat standardized, which is sweet. But that's basically just the attribute. Um, and there's a lot more to it than that. So specifically, there are these supporting APIs that go with it. Um, and and this, is, this is what the fragmentation that I was talking about, um, that's where that fragmentation existed. And now the, the W3C is trying to organize that and, and coordinate what the API should look like, which is great. Um, and so we're getting a little bit more standardization. But um, as far as figuring out which browsers are actually supporting the standard and what else they're supporting in addition to the standard as far as those earlier APIs, um, that documentation is, is not really available in any useful way. And then in addition to the APIs, you have these sort of indirect requirements that, that you might need to um, work with if you, if you want to use content editable at a higher level. Um, you need to be able to look at the, the text that's been selected because that's how you are going to be able to do things to the, the text in the content editable area. And then you, might, you might need to be able to actually change and control those selections um, and give context to the commands you're using. Um, 
And this all gets a little bit weird. These are, these are parts of the browser that we don't normally deal with as, as front-end developers in our day-to-day -day work. This is outside the DOM. This is actually the stuff that the browser is doing in its internals um, that we would normally kind of leave alone, as we probably should. Um, so to, to kind of sum it up, um, content editable is, is cute and fuzzy, and it's really accessible. Exec command, which is the API, is, is an alien from outer space that lives at the bottom of the ocean and wants to eat your soul. So let's talk about the fun and easy part first before we get scary. It's really easy to use it um, if you've never used content. Who's, who's never used content editable before? OK, well, so this will be very useful. Um, so you just throw the attribute on any element, and then your user can go in there and change the text. And um, once you have that, in, in, because it does, it's not in a, in a form, it's not tied to a form like um, other things that the user would be changing text in, you can either um, explicitly submit that text using a button and have them save it that way, or you can use uh, the input event, which is a new event in the DOM. Um, it's like input or on input. Um, and that will, that will notify JavaScript when, um, when, when any of that text changes. So if you want to track every keystroke, you can do that. And this is what the, the JavaScript for that looks like. So we have a, um, a region here where we're going to um, just, um, sorry for the jQuery. If, if you don't use jQuery, um, hopefully you can figure out what's going on here. Um, so we have this edit region, um, and we're going to tr turn on the content editable property. And then we'll focus the cursor into it, um, just using the focus method. And then um, when, whenever the user leaves that field, we will, um, at that point, copy whatever's in that content editable area and move it into another, an actual text area so that we can see the source, including the HTML. And that's, that's all we have to do to basically um, allow the user to edit text. Um, and we don't even have to do that. We can just do this all in HTML. But if we want to be able to, to do something with it in JavaScript, like that's, that's as complicated as it, as it needs to be. So it's, it's exciting. That's, that's, that's all it takes um, if we just want to make a text area, which we already have natively in HTML. So there are actually other useful um, applications for content editable beyond just duplicating the, the text area. Um, it's great if you don't want to have to write JavaScript to toggle between a display and an input state for basically anything that contains text. Um, like I mentioned, it can contain um, any of the markup it contains doesn't get displayed. So like whatever like bolding is going on or like italicizing or anything like that, you don't see that and the user doesn't see that. So if, if they're freaked out by HTML, you can hide all that from them. Um, and this is great if you want to provide like lightweight text editing capabilities for your users without having to um, download something like CK Editor that's going to be a nightmare. But there are caveats. Um, all the editing that you get with content editor by, by default is just, just text. So you can go in and you can, you can type and you can delete things and that's about it. Um, you, can, you can get yourself in a situation where other elements are stealing the focus, um, which becomes uh, important when you start working with the exec command and its, its API. Um, so you, you probably want to end up using buttons if you, if you write some kind of text editor rather than links because a link will steal the focus and then you won't have your selection anymore that you need to operate on. Um, and you have to kind of figure this all out um, like in the dark blind because, again, there's, there's no real documentation for it. And of course, it's also going to drive you crazy. So if, this is a content editable area. So I can click in here, and I can type some new text. Yay, text. And I can delete some of this other text. Delete. So it works exactly like a, like a text area or whatever. Exec command um, looks like this. So here's the same thing. And now I can take this and bold it. And I can italicize this thing here. Um, if I want to do both at the same time, that's totally cool. And um, firing the same exec command twice will toggle on and off. So I can woo, change it back and forth. So that's, that's what exec command does, basically. And the code for that is almost as simple as, as the code just to create a content editable area. So what I've done here is I've, I've gotten a node list of all those buttons, all two of them, and then I'll loop through them and I'll attach an event listener to um, the click event. And when, when I get that click event, I will um, run, run exec command, which is just document.exec command right here. Um, and I'm going to pass it the inner text of, of both of those buttons, which very conveniently is um, the, the name of the command bold and italic. Um, and that's it. 
All I have to do is pass in that string, and that takes care of bolding and italicizing for me. So exec command has three arguments, which we'll, we'll talk about in detail. There's the command ID, um, there's the show UI boolean, and then the third one is the value. So command IDs look like this. So our friends bold and italic are represented on this list. And you can see that most of these things, you can probably figure out what they do just by looking at them. It's pretty, pretty evident what's going to happen if you, if you use one of these commands. Um, and uh, if you look at them, the, the ones that, that don't imply actions, like undo or redo, um, you, can, you can kind of tell what, what, um, what markup they might insert, which is cool. These are the old um, command IDs that are no longer supported, or that are, that are not in the standard. So this comes from MDN, and this document was last updated in um, 2007. So that gives you some idea of how far back we're going in our little time machine. Um, and so you, you might notice that a lot of these have to do with um, more stuff that we would expect to handle with CSS. Like this is all a lot of like styling stuff beyond just, beyond just markup, um, or that's what seems to be implied by this list. And then there's also um, a set of IE commands that we're just not going to talk about at all because even I, IE doesn't support them, um, and they get really weird. Like they go, they go back to like when somebody was obviously going to do something very different with this that was going to be a lot more. Um, oh, I forgot the name of it's that thing that starts with an A that I, I used to do. It doesn't matter. Um, but it, a lot more application-y than um, than what this has ended up being. ActiveX. ActiveX is right, yes, correct. Um, so, the second argument is show UI, which is a Boolean. And this is generally not implemented in uh, most browsers. But if it is implemented and it is set to true, then it will show a vendor UI. And so this little screenshot here is what you get in IE when you, um, you use the create link command and you pass it true as the second argument and you don't pass it a value. And so it'll give you this little window that will allow you to put a URL into the um, the create links value um, if you if you don't want to like write a modal or whatever to do that and you don't need this for any simple commands like bold metallic um, just for things that take a value this is absolutely unspecified in the standard there's there's no information at all on what browsers should do or what this argument should mean um, it's just still there so there's always a second argument so if you want to have a third argument which you do for many things um, you have to have this second argument present which is kind of annoying. And then the third argument is the value argument. So for any of the complex commands, um, things that you want to insert a URL or some HTML or some CSS, um, you're going to use that value argument to, to actually do that. Um, and these tend to end up as either the attributes of the tags you're inserting or the actual markup or tags that are going into your content editable area. And you might be thinking, this is interesting stuff. This sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun to play around with. but. That would be a mistake. There are some issues with all this stuff. Um, whether, whether you've selected uh, the correct amount of text and the correct type of text can affect whether these commands work. Um, the same commands produce different markup between different browsers. The values you pass in is that third argument. Those may not get um, appended as you've, as you've supplied them. They may be transformed into something else. Or they may just be completely ignored, and your command may fail. Um, and if you're if you're listening for errors, that's great. But if you're not, then you're not going to get any meaningful information. And really, you're not going to get a lot of meaningful information anyway. Because guess what? The level of the documentation for the errors is it's about the same as everything else. Um, and that's basically n not reliable and, and not really accessible. So to, to demonstrate what I'm talking about when I complain and complain and complain about content editables APIs, we'll try to add a class to some of this text. So I want to make some of this text pink. So I'm going to select a little text here. And the first thing we'll try is um, an, a non-standard command style with CSS, but that sounds like exactly what we want, right? So we'll say color pink. And nope, no pink. OK. well. That's fine. Um, that was a non-standard one, so it makes sense that it wouldn't work. Let's do format block. So we have a block here. This is obviously a block. We'll format this block. Um, we'll say div class equals pink. OK. Not OK. So that doesn't work either for some reason. And I know the reason, but we'll get to that. Um, so let's just try inserting some HTML. Like, this is another standard command. This should work, right? So we'll go up here to the beginning, and we'll just insert 
div class equals pink. Okay, cross your fingers. Nothing. Maybe it's because we didn't put in an ending tag. Let's put in an ending tag. Still nothing. Um, what you actually have to do to create some pink text is supply an entire new string of HTML. And that will give you pink text. And now that you have pink text, whoops, you have to remember to focus in the text area before you mouse around. Um, now this is great because now we can just copy all of this into our, our new pink area here and that will work, right? Nope. So this is what's annoying about content editable. This is where it will begin to drive you crazy because things that seem like they should work don't work at all. So let's talk about what does work. Um, any kind of traditional marking up you want to do, like you want to subscript something, you want to bold it, that all works great. If you want to make a list of some sort, that's cool. You want to indent stuff, awesome, you can do that. You want to undo and redo and do those sort of very basic editor kind of commands, that's great. Um, you can do some basic selection with exec command out of the box. Um, and in the, in the non-standard APIs, um, you may want to note that you can actually still do color and font kind of stuff uh, fairly reliably across browsers. You don't, you don't get consistent um, HTML, but it works. Um, so if you actually wanted to make that text pink in a non-standard way, you could just use font color. Um, so I was lying a little bit. So let's talk about the stuff that gets generated from those commands. Um, normally you get the tags you would expect, and like I mentioned, when you look at the, the set of uh, standard commands, you can, you can kind of tell what you're going to get. Um, the exception would be IE, which uses um, strong and M instead of B and I for, for bolding, bolding and italicizing. Um, and if you're, if you're going to play around with the non-standard commands, um, it's, it's interesting to note that you get a span for most of that stuff, that, which, which will have some inline CSS. Um, except for IE, where you get a font tag, so you can still use the font tag if you want to keep doing that. And then you get stuff that's magically generated, which is where things get really interesting, and that's what the, the pink text example, that's what happened there at the end. Um, so by default, you might have a div, or you might have a P as your, um, as your block element, or you might have nothing at all with just some, some BRs between it. Um, you can change that if format block works, which it does not in IE. Um, and in Firefox, it only allows certain, um, certain types of blocks, so it has to be something that HTML4 recognizes as a block level element, so you can't, you can't format a block with a span, you can't use a section or an article. And even if, even if you can get that working, you might still get yourself in a situation where your formatted block is actually wrapped by something else, and um, you, can, you can very easily um, create nests that you wouldn't necessarily anticipate. So let's, let's go over all the standard commands very quickly so you have an understanding of, of what is available and what you can expect from it. So the things that, that are pretty much rock solid are bold italic, uh, subscript, and superscript, so all your, your basic marking up, create, creating links and uh, removing links, um, deleting, and then forward delete. Um, forward delete actually doesn't work in IE, but I'm going to forgive that here because the only actual use case I can imagine for forward delete is if your, your user was typing some stuff and you wanted to eliminate one character at a time just to screw with them. Um, and then, of course, inserting ordered lists and unordered lists also works. So those are all cool. You can use those right out of the box. Format block, um, as I mentioned, does not work so consistently. Um, format block only accepts tags, which is why it got rejected when I tried to put in div class equals pink because there are no attributes allowed. Um, and in Firefox, as mentioned, there's a finite list of blocks that you can use. In IE, there's no support at all. Um, and using format block, if it, in the browsers it does work, and will uh, then alter the block type of subsequent blocks that you insert using enter. This family of commands, um, insert HTML, insert image, insert line break, insert paragraph, and insert text, um, all the things that insert stuff, um, these all work great in Chrome and Firefox. These all do absolutely nothing in IE. Um, not even anything. Um, and uh, insert HTML is an interesting one because it's going to try to parse your invalid markup for you. So instead of rejecting stuff that it doesn't like, it'll try to fix it for you. So if you type um, angle bracket lol HTML bad, it will try to make that into a lol tag for you. Um, even Firefox, which um, which you know doesn't doesn't allow you to insert um, uh, 
non-standard uh, HTML tags for, for format block, we'll, we'll very happily try to make anything else into HTML for you if you use insert HTML. So that's cool, I guess, if you want to make a wall tag. Um, and uh, in insert text, you'll be happy to know that it, it escapes HTML just like it should. So these are, these are pretty, pretty solid in the browsers they work in, um, which is unfortunately not all of them. Redo and undo um, both work in Firefox and Chrome as well. You can undo in IE, but um, what my testing leads me to believe is that in IE, there's the user, the user takes their action and then IE does other stuff. And so if you want to undo, you have to click undo twice because you have to first undo the stuff that IE did after whatever the user did, which is a little weird. Um, so it's, it's, it doesn't really work as expected in IE. Um, and IE doesn't have redo at all. Select all and unselect, um, these both work in Chrome. Um, select all works in Firefox, and it works in IE if you want to select everything on the page. Um, if you just want to select what's in your content editable area, you should probably use some more um, bespoke JavaScript. Um, and there's no unselect in Firefox or IE, so you'll have to actually position the cursor and, and fake a, a click if you want to get things unselected. So what this means is that you can expect consistent markup from these commands. Um, if you want to, if you want to have um, free form values that the the user is inserting for attributes um, that would become the value ar argument, that's probably not going to work. Um, and especially if your if your user wants to create special kinds of content areas that like have a have a class or like use a specific tag name that they're going to do something special with, that's not going to work. So essentially, you can do minimal formatting and you can rely on that to work. Um, but if you want to provide your users a CMS and use content editable and exec command out of the box to do that. No. So, summary. It's not as easy and fun to use exec command as it is to simply use content editable. But the good news is you don't have to rely on exec command. So because you have a content editable area, your user is able to position the cursor and select some text, which is all you need to, to start doing interesting things. You can, you can either insert markup um, at the position of a cursor, or you can take a selection and wrap it with some, some tags and some HTML. Um, and, and that works, um, but it's not a good alternative to exec command because it's easy and fun. It's a good alternative because it works. Because there's browser consistency here. Yay. Um, so we have the, the context selection API, which, which does work consistently across the modern versions of the major browsers. Um, you have window.get selection, which gives you a selection object. And then that selection object has um, an anchor node and a focus node that you can use to, to figure out where the selection is and what's inside of it. And there are other things that are consistent as well. Um, but this is, th these three things are essentially all we need to, to start faking our own exec command stuff. And we just need this tiny little bit of code to do that. Ha ha ha, that's not a tiny bit of code. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through this. Um, we're not gonna, I'm not doing any live coding because I'm not as brave as the other presenters. Um, but so all we're doing here is we're going to, we're gonna get the, the selection object that, that's current. So whenever, whenever the user clicks a button, we'll figure out what they've selected. And then we will, um, we're gonna get the, the essentially the, the position of where where they put the cursor down in the position where they picked it up. So the start is where they put it down, the end is where they picked it up. Um, and then we'll get the anchor node, which is the, the node containing the, the beginning of the selection. And then we'll get the focus node, which is the node containing the end of the selection. And those can be different nodes, and they may not be elements. We'll also get the parent. So we're gonna check to see whether, we're gonna try to check to see whether the, um, the starting node is is completely encompassed by the selection. So if if the position of the the <laughs> this is so hard um, the position of the beginning of the selection is zero within its parent, and the length of the node containing it is the same as the parent of that node, um, the length of the parent of that node, we're going to make the anchor um, its parent, um, which will be. Uh, I'll try to explain why in a second. And then we're gonna do the same thing with the end. Um, so if, if the end is at the very end of whatever, um, whatever node it's in, um, and then it's the, it's the same length as its parent, um, we will we'll, we'll use the, the parent as the focus node. 
And then if these two are not the same, um, we're going to return false because we want these to be at the same depth. We don't want the we don't want one to be nested deeper than the other, um, and we don't want them to be like across two divs or something like that because we're not going to get as as fancy as like trying to insert the tag here like in one div and then insert it again in the second div. We're just going to say can we can we wrap something um, and not not break any child nodes. So um, then we have to we have to loop through everything on the parent. Um, so we've that's the reason we have this parent um, is is to to get access to all the nodes. So presumably now we should have a parent here. This anchor parent should contain both our our anchor node and our focus node. And we're going to loop through all the contents and we're going to try to find those two things so that we know where to insert our beginning and ending tags. Um, so we're also um, we have a string up here, new HTML, which is where we're going to put the HTML of everything that's in there. Um, so if these two are the same, if the anchor and the focus node are the same thing, then this is kind of easy. We'll check, we'll check the node type. Um, so if the node type is one, then this is an actual element. That's great, because then all we have to do is um, add our start tag, add the outer HTML of that node, and then add the end tag, and then we're done. We'll append that to our new HTML. If it's, an, if it's node type three, um, that means it's a text node, and so then we have to do um, some much more complicated stuff with substrings. So we have to actually get the the substring of um, the the part that's the part that's within the selection um, within the anchor node. Then we'll insert our, our start tag. Then we'll get the rest of the string that's between the start and the end. Then we'll insert the end tag, and then we'll get the substring that's outside of um, the the selection if there is one. Um, if this doesn't make a lot of sense, that's okay, um, because this is where I say that this will make you crazy, because trying to write this and figure this all out um, is kind of painful, as, as most things are when they have this many conditionals, right? Um, so essentially what we're going to do is we're going to loop through all the contents in the parent node, be they elements or text nodes. We're going to append them to one big long string, and then down here at the bottom we're going to replace the inner HTML of the anchor parent with that string. The reason we're not doing this in a more dynamic way with inserting elements um, is because we basically can't. Um, all, of these, all of these selection um, properties are very fragile, so if we screw with the, the HTML at all, as soon as we touch the HTML we're going to lose our selection and all of this information we have about where things should be will become invalid, so that's why we're doing this, this uh, string manipulation kind of stuff to, to create HTML. And that code is minimally functional. That's not production ready. Um, so it won't wrap nodes that don't share a parent. As you saw, it's going to exit out if they don't have the same parent. It's not going to expand the um, and, and duplicate the tag for, for two different parents. Um, our, our HTML is hard coded. That's pretty easy to fix, actually. Um, it only works in forward selections because we're looping through all of our, our contents in order. That means that we can only go left to right in English um, and because that's, that's how we're expecting to insert the start and end node. It would be very, very, not very complicated, but we would need um, a different level of complexity if we wanted to be able to go either direction. And that's important because um, people don't always select left to right. Sometimes they select right to left. And if that works, then all that code breaks. So there's a bunch more that's probably wrong with that code, but if we wanted to ship it to production, those are the three things that we would have to fix first. But try, try not to think too much about all the, all the things that are wrong with that, and let's just talk about the technique behind it, um, because it is something you would need to know to be able to work with um, content editable areas if you want to be able to provide consistent um, alternatives to exec command. So getting access to selections um, works great. You can use window.selection in all modern browsers and you get the selection. And um, if you just want to, if you don't want to do anything to it, if you just want to see what's been selected, you can just use two string on that object and um, you'll get the text that's in the selection. Awesome. Um, you can also get access to all the ranges in the selection, which uh, used to be how you manipulated selections. Um, if you're not sure what a range is, that's okay because neither is the W3C. So if you figure, you want to figure out what's in the selection, right? You usually don't just want the string, but bless your heart if you do, because you're going to save a lot of time. Um, so you have the anchor node and the focus node that define the beginning and the end of the selection, and then you may have child, child nodes within, within that selection um, that may or may not be the anchor node and the focus node. So what you need to do is basically find a common parent, and like we did, loop through all the child nodes and test for equality. Um, and any of these nodes may be text nodes. And in fact, some of them probably are text nodes. 
And if you've never worked with text nodes, who's not familiar with what I'm talking about when I say text node? Anybody? Oh, you guys are great. OK, well, just very brief um, reminder then. Um, text nodes have to use node value instead of inner HTML. You can't add HTML to them. You, you might think that um, adding some HTML would automatically uh, make the, the text node become an element. That won't work. You just get the HTML in the string. Um, and these appear in every tag, so they, anything that's contained in the tag is actually inside a text node. Um, there's, there's another level of nesting there that we don't usually talk about. And we can't, we can't use selectors to find them, so if you have a bunch of um, text nodes in your, in your, your, your object um, or your, your element, that they just say the, like, you, there's, there's no meaningful way to, to look for them based on like, their contents or like, their, anything other than their position, basically, as children of something else. And so this is why we have to loop and test for equality. And this becomes really relevant when we uh, start dealing with the context selection API, because all these selections want to be text nodes. If you if you try to like let's say you you selected something and you have um, the simple editor that we were looking at before that does bold and italic. Let's say you you select something, you click bold, and then immediately you try to look at the the selection there. You won't get a bold element. You will get the the text node within it. Um, and so if you want to if you want to do something like wrapping an element like that that code that I just showed you, um, you have to go and get the the node's parent manually. And so that's like why we were doing that that. Um, that weird thing at the beginning where we were trying to, to tell whether the, the entire node was selected because if we can get an element, then it's, it's a little simpler to work with. But the bottom line is that it does work, and I hope I will be able to show you this. Let's, let's try and get on a different Wi-Fi. Oh, <laughs> I didn't sure. Thank you. I feel really bad. I could have like loaded this up before, and I for some reason I didn't. I'm so sorry. Okay, let's try it again. View. What is going on? I can't get out of presenter mode. <laughs> Okay, wow, that, that's apparently broken my computer. So uh, I was going to show you. Um, I was, I was going to show you that it does work, but um, unfortunately, I can't do that right now. Um, but um, this, I'll put these online later, and you can you can verify for yourself. So you won't have to just take my word for it. But yeah. Um, so additionally, um, in, in addition to being able to get selections and and try to insert things, we actually need to be able to position the cursor for a lot of this kind of stuff that we we want to do because there's there's a certain expectation that if the user um, selects something and then takes an action there that will continue to be selected that's what happens with exec command natively, which um, seems really obvious and simple until you actually start trying to duplicate it um, this this worked in i e in old versions of i e um, Interestingly, there was there's a, a method called set selection that would do what it says on the tin and set a selection for you. So you would you would go into whatever code you were doing that was manipulating your content editable stuff, and you would um, you would cache the result of get range at zero. Um, one of the things I can tell you about ranges is that there's generally only one of them. Um, I've run into very few. Uh, I was able to create very few examples, very few meaning zero, where there was there was a length greater than one of the the ranges list. Um, so you get the range at zero, which is the only one that you have. Um, then you would do whatever you're going to do to manipulate stuff, and then you would pass that range back in using set selection, and that would work. Unfortunately, that no longer works. Um, but you would think that you could do the same thing by just manually setting the selections ranges, right? Because now we have um, we have methods in the standard. We don't have a set selection, but we do have a method that allows you to empty out the list of ranges in your current selection, and then we have one that allows you to add a range to the current selection. So you'd think you could do the same thing. But for some reason, that doesn't work at all, and I can't tell you why. Um, I can just tell you to write your congressman or your local browser representative and try to, try to get that fixed. Um, so what you can do, um, you can use focus, um, and that will position your cursor in the container. And that's about all I can guarantee. It might position it at the beginning, it might position it at the end, depending on the browser and the version, but it will get it into the container. 
you can do something a little bit more sophisticated if you know um, if you have a way to index some node that's either the the content editable area itself or some some element within it. Um, as soon as you have a reference to an element, you can then use select all children. Select all children does not work with a text node, unfortunately. So e even if you had a, a list of contents, you don't have a way to um, to pass it one of one of your text nodes within that, and and use select all children on that. So it has to be a proper element, but you can use select all children, um, and that will that will give you everything within that element. Um, and then you can um, collapse to the end or to the start of that that selection if you just want to position the cursor at the beginning or end of it. So you can do a little bit of stuff. Um, so like if if we were um, in the the example that we were looking at that code, um, we we basically know um, what the the element is because we're we're creating an element. So we have hopefully a way to get a selector on that element, and then we can in turn pass it into select all children, and we would be able to actually recreate the selection that we used to have there. So that's kind of cool. So that's that's basically all the advanced stuff I have to tell you about content editable. And so how, now hopefully you have some more insight into what kind of weird tricks and weird magic you need to do to actually make it work and do advanced stuff with it. Um, hopefully you know a little bit about what not to expect from it, which is any sort of consistency, um, and hopefully what to do instead and some of the, the hacks that, um, that I'm able to offer you and you, you may have good ideas as well. And if you've been sitting here going, okay, I know what content editable is, but I never use it in the real world, I have some things to say to you. Um, so we have all these cutting edge browser features and they're awesome, they're amazing, they get a lot of attention and therefore they get implemented quickly. All the browser makers come together and they kind of standardize them pretty quickly and we get a good uh, back and forth between the browser manufacturers and the W3C. But in the meantime, we have all these little esoteric things that, that may have existed for years and years and those don't tend to get standardized as quickly and in the fragmentation kind of perpetuates itself even if they're in the standard. And you need to be able to work with that stuff and if you don't believe me, please consider the XHR which is another one of those esoteric things that people were like, oh this is weird and non-standard and everybody's going to do it their own way and then we're like, hey we're going to actually be able to change the entire way we write websites using this weird esoteric property so like let's let's all figure out how to use this. Um, th there, there's a lot of power in that stuff. Like. These ideas existed at some point for a reason and we can do cool stuff with them. And cool stuff doesn't have to mean WebGL and shit flying around the screen. It can mean being able to edit text. It can mean being able to send asynchronously back and forth to the server. So please consider that if you're, if you're thinking that this doesn't apply to you. Because the important thing is that you're able to work with these ancient APIs. So just like some very brief lessons on that. Like don't assume that your document is up to date, documentation is up to date. Um, don't assume that the standards are actually implemented anywhere, um, completely anyway. Um, just write your own test page. Like, it's fun and interesting and will expand your mind and drive you crazy um, to create your own test for this stuff and figure it out that way. And then basically all the documentation you need, you can get from your developer tools just by using console.dir and figuring out what methods are actually available on an element and what you can actually do with it in the real world in the browsers that you are supporting. Because, I mean, it's, it's much better to be able to, to do this stuff than to be seen. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, uh, do you think uh, content editable should be like fixed, like try to get it more uh, consistent between browsers, or should uh, the browser vendors do like level two or something? <laughs> <laughs> What's your take on that? I, I think they should definitely try to fix. Um, they sh they should at least try to implement the standard as specified because everything that's in the standard like would fix all the weird bugs and problems that, that I, I, I mentioned during the talk. Like if, if everything in the standard worked and worked among all the browsers and worked consistently, like you could easily eliminate all that stuff. So I don't think there's any, any need for a level two, at least not until we get level one working and figure out what more we want to do with it. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm wondering, this seems like it's designed to drive people crazy. Uh, so. <laughs> And you don't seem very enthusiastic about it <laughs> yourself. Oh, I love it. No. <laughs> so I'm wondering if there is a really good use case for it. You know, is there a flagship implementation that you would 
gladly show off to people who might want to use this? Um, uh, I, Without like appearing to be selling anything, um, I, I'm, I mentioned that I'm not working, but I'm actually going to start uh, working for a company in June um, called Editorially, and they um, they make a, an editor basically, um, which which has um, sort of rich text capabilities, and it's it's useful for that. But it, I, I I have this um, this all sort of came about because. I, I originally um, needed to create just like a very simple text editor. I didn't want to use TK editor because it's a nightmare. I didn't want to use um, t tiny, whatever it is, the, the tiny one that's not tiny. Um, and I just wanted to be able to provide some simple commands. And I was like, oh, this will be easy. We can just use content editable and exec command. And that was where I started down this rabbit hole myself. Um, and I, I've needed to do similar things a number of times. And it, it seems like it should be simpler than it is. But it's also a lot of fun. Like I, I don't mean to like I, like I'm I'm complaining just just to to tell a good story. I actually love all this stuff, and I think it's a lot of fun to try to figure out. So, yeah. Uh, is there a polyfill or a simple framework that makes it simpler to work with this? Um, I think that there are a few, um, but for the most part, I think there are. Um, they're just editors, like the, they're edit like Aloha editor uses uses content editable and like does that. And I think there's there's a newer one that's even smaller than Aloha editor and like has a, a, a simpler set of commands. Um, but um, I I'm not actually I'm not really sure what what polyfills and plugins are available that that abstract this stuff out to just for abstract usage. I've had the misfortune of using uh, content editable myself. Um, and the thing that really blew my mind was a paragraph tag. I had a content editable paragraph tag. And when the user was done typing, he would usually press tab to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And instead of de blurring the paragraph, it would create another paragraph below it. And I wasn't watching that other paragraph tag. So if you typed away in that paragraph tab and press tab again and typed away, I would just lose all that content. So I was <laughs> thinking, did you ever encounter that? And do you have a fix for it? I don't have a fix for it, um, and I'm sorry for your pain. <laughs> um, that's about all I can say. Uh, like, just, I, th I think again, it's just like I th that's why we don't really need that. Um, that I think that's why it becomes appealing to try and like fake con or fake the exact command stuff because that way you can assert a little bit more control, even though it's a lot more painful to write. Um, because yeah, you get those really unpredictable results, and you're never really sure what's going to happen when people start messing with the text in their content editable as it relates to the tags in there. Is that it? Yeah, you just get to give away a phone. Um, I, I think I, I, I want to give it to this fellow over here who who asked about um the, the 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 use case for this and the actual need for it. That was a good question. Thank you.